thing we ask of you, one thing that we desire, that as we worship you, Lord, come and change our lives. Arise, 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 take your place, be enthroned on our praise. Arise, King of kings, holy God, as we sing, arise, 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 arise. One thing we ask of you, one thing that we desire, that as we worship you, Lord, come and change our lives. Arise, 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 arise. take your place, be enthroned on our praise. Arise, King of kings, holy God, as we sing, arise, 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 arise. Lord, change our lives. Jesus, 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 arise. Arise, 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 arise. Take your place, be enthroned on our praise. Arise, King of kings, holy God, as we sing. Arise, arise, arise. Father, I see that you are drawing line in the sand, and I want to be standing on your side, holding your hand. So let your kingdom come, let it live in me. This is my prayer, this is my plea. Father, I see that you are drawing a line in the sand and i want to be standing on your side holding your hand so let your kingdom come let it live in me this is my prayer this is my plea let the worshipers arise let the sons and the daughters see Surrender in my all. I surrender to the King. Let the worshippers arise. Let the sons and the daughters sing. I surrender in my all. I surrender to the King. Father, I hear it growing louder, the song of your redeemed, as the saints of every nation are awakening to sing. From our hearts there comes an anthem, oh, hear the heavens ring, this is our song, a song to our King, let the worshippers arise, let the sons and the daughters sing. I surrender in my all. I surrender to the King. 
Let the worshippers arise. Let the sons and the daughters sing. I surrender in my... Uh, also, don't forget uh, for all the uh, young men to... Uh, any age men that would like to be part of our uh, Gavin and I's um, singing class. That's uh, Sunday starting at 4.30 here at the building. Uh, there's still a sign-up sheet in the back if you'd like to be a part of that. It's a one-on-one -on -one, uh, teaching class. So if you would, please bow. Dear most gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you so very much for this day that you've given us today, Lord. We thank you for the sunshine. Lord, we thank you for our homes, Lord. We thank you for the ability to stay cool, Lord. We thank you for all the many wondrous things that you give us, Lord. Lord, we thank you for this time that you blessed us to study in your word, Lord, to worship and to sing praises unto you. Lord, we pray that all that we do this evening may be good in your sight. Lord, we have many on our minds this evening that we may or may not know of who are in need of our prayers. Lord, we want to pray that you will be with all of those who are sick, Lord, those who are out traveling. We pray that you'll keep them safe. Lord, we want to pray for those who are who have lost loved ones, Lord, those who are about to undergo treatments or surgeries, Lord, we want to pray that you will be with them. We pray for all of those tending to their care, Lord. We pray that you will guide them and help them. Lord, we want to pray that you will always try to guide us as individuals, Lord. We pray that our Christ-like light will shine to others, Lord. We pray that we can bring more to you to know that you are the one and true living God. Lord, we thank you so very much for your Son, who you sent to die upon a cross for us, Lord, that we may have a hope in heaven with you someday. And we ask all these things through his name. Amen. Good evening. To start our service out tonight, I'll be singing number 924, 924, the first and last verse. just me or does it seem like people complain a lot? <laughs> I don't think it's just me. Uh, it seems like people complain a lot. Uh, I can't retire in two years because the stock market isn't doing well. Uh, some guy said something that offended me. Uh, some other guy cut me off in traffic. Uh, my co-workers are idiots, you know. It's, uh, I hear complaints like this all the time from people who have food to eat, clothes to wear, a roof over their heads, and are also reasonably healthy. Even if these complaints are true, is it helpful to complain endlessly about things we can't control, especially things that are minor, really, in the grand scheme of things? Some say we're less prosperous than we were in the 1980s. Uh, did everyone have a cell phone and a big screen TV back then? 
We have bigger houses, better cars, and more gadgets than our parents could have possibly imagined, yet happiness often eludes us. So what's the problem? We look for happiness where it doesn't exist, is one part, one reason. Uh, looking for wheat in a cornfield is pointless. You won't find it there. Likewise, looking for happiness in material possessions is pointless. You will not find it there. You have to find the true source of happiness in order to acquire it. Paul said this to the church in Philippi, in Philippians 4, verses 11 through 13. I've learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know how to get along with humble means, and I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Paul also described himself in 2 Corinthians 6, verse 10, as being sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, as poor, yet making many rich, as having nothing, yet possessing everything. Paul is telling us that happiness is not found in the abundance or lack of material possessions. Happiness is about the promise of eternal life that comes from God through faith in Jesus Christ. That's where true happiness is. If we are naked and destitute, yet we have this promise from God, yet we have nothing materially, in material terms, but we still possess everything. We have that promise from God. And same thing Peter said in Acts 2, 38 and 39. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. The promise is not just for them. It was for them and their children and everyone who is far off, you and me today. If you're here tonight and you haven't obeyed the gospel, the call is for you too. Will you heed the call? Will you be baptized for the remission of your sins and start living your life for God instead of for yourself? Because God wants you to be baptized and for the forgiveness of sins. He wants you to spend eternity in heaven with him. But if you haven't done that, you're contrary to his will. That's not what he wants. But you have to believe, you have to confess. I can't make you believe, I can't force you to believe. I can't put a gun to your head and make you believe or be baptized or anything else. It has to be your choice. Um, but it's, it's a choice worth making. It's a choice that will change your life. So if you haven't, I urge you to come forward tonight and do that. If you're here and you're struggling, and we all struggle, we all have bad days, we all have tough times, we all have things that are on our minds, um, whatever it may be, there are people here who would like to help you with that. If you would like, if you have any need at all, come as we stand and sing. classes. Yep. No podium.
Uh, again, hope everyone is doing well tonight. Um, we talked last week about Jonah and Moses. We were in 1 Corinthians 1, but we also talked about Jonah and Moses who were very reluctant when God called them. And I wanted to talk about that for a second. Uh, and if you would turn to Matthew chapter 21, verses 28 through 32. Matthew 21, verses 28 through 32. Um, I didn't want to say uh, last week I was really tired when I got home. And uh, sometimes I look at myself afterward just to see if there's anything I could do better or learn or if I said anything really stupid. So uh, I was watching the thing and uh, I got home, I was really tired, so I had an entire 16 ounce diet Mountain Dew. And I noticed I was talking kind of fast. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, but somebody uh, told me that they were having trouble keeping up with me, and I thought, well, and they had a point. So I'll see if I can talk a little slower this week. But also, um, when I call out Bible verses and say you can turn to them, um, you don't have to turn to them. That's just if you want to. If it's easier for you to just listen, that's fine, too. Uh, what, I just want everyone to feel, I don't want anyone to feel left behind, left out, or whatever. And I can't stop and have a one-on-one 10-minute -on -one conversation with you in the middle of class. But if you, after class, if you have something you want to talk about, you don't understand, you have a question, uh, stop and talk to me about it. Again, it's about, it's about everybody being involved. It's not about me. So that's my public service announcement for tonight. Okay, so Matthew chapter 21, verses 28 through 32. So let's read them. What do you think? This is Christ speaking. What do you think? A man had two sons, and he went to the first and said, Son, go and work in the vineyard today. And he answered, I will not. But afterward he changed his mind and went. And he went to the other son and said the same, and he answered, I go, sir, but did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said, the first. Jesus said to them, and, and they, that's the right answer. Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes go to the kingdom of God before you. He's talking to the Pharisees here, the Jewish leaders. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And even when you saw that they believed him, even when you saw it, you did not afterward change your minds and believe him. So in this story, the, the father represents God, of course. Um, the first son represents the tax collectors and the prostitutes. Uh, they were disobedient to God, they, I, they refused to work in his vineyard, but they heard John preaching, believed him, and repented. The second son represents the Jewish leaders who claimed to work in God's vineyard but were disobedient and refused to repent. Now obviously it would have been better if both sons had agreed to work and then actually went to work in the vineyard, but Christ says here that a reluctant servant who does his duty anyway is far better than a hypocrite who claims to serve God but does not. And uh, it, when I'm thinking of this, I'm thinking of a story of my father-in-law, Laura's dad. Um, the first time, I, I knew he served in World War II, the first time I asked him, did, I asked him, did you, first time I asked him anything about it, I asked him, did you, did you volunteer? And he said, no way, I was drafted. And he had a few choice words to say about FDR drafting him. Uh, he was an East Tennessee Republican, so he didn't care for FDR anyway. Uh, but. He got drafted, and um, he was working at Alcoa in East Tennessee. They were making war materials, aluminum, which they make planes out of. That's one of the major, if not the major, component in an airplane, material that goes into an airplane. And he said, you know, it got to the point where his boss said, I can't keep you out of the, out of the war anymore. You're going to get drafted. The only way I can keep you out is if you get married. He says, well, I don't want to get married. And so <laughs> he gets drafted. He's over there. And I, I said, well, once you got over there and people started shooting at you, did you think maybe Getting married might have been the more des <laughs> the less <laughs> the more desirable option than being shot at. He he got a kick out of that. Um, but the point is, he didn't want to go. He uh, and you know some people volunteered, some people didn't. But he went and he did his duty. Um, he didn't want to go and camp out for two and a half years and wash himself out of a helmet and. Uh, he was in an, in an anti-aircraft unit, and they, you know, they were getting shelled and, and everything else. You know, nobody wants to be shot at. Uh, but he went and he did his duty anyway, like a lot of men back then. And I see him, you know, as a reluctant servant. But he did what he needed to do. That's why his generation was called the greatest generation. 
they were called and yeah, they weren't crazy about doing it, but they went anyway. So, and, and we're all reluctant servants at times. Uh, sometimes I don't feel like getting out of bed and going to work in the morning, but uh, I get up and go anyway because jo God has a job for me to do. He, he put me, provided me with this job and I know that um, I have a part to play there. And uh, also I need to provide for my family. And it's not always easy doing what God asks us to do, but if we love him, even when it's tough, even when it's not exactly what we're crazy about doing at the moment, if we love him, we do it to the best of our ability, and that's all he asks of us. So before we go on, I was going to, any thoughts, any comments about that before we move on? Okay, so back to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, starting in verse 10. That's where we, we were, we'd gone through verse 9 last week, and we'll go to verse 10 here. And Paul's going to talk about divisions in the church here. He says, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree, and there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people, there is quarreling among you, my brothers. What I mean is that each, of you, each one of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Paulus, or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. And so he asks him some really pointed questions here to point out the error of following men. So is Christ divided? The answer is no. Was Paul crucified for you? Absolutely not. Christ was crucified for you. Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that none of you may, no one may say that you were baptized in my name. In other words, I don't want anybody saying that you follow me or any other man. We follow Christ. And it's interesting that, you know, throughout history, you know, you see the Israelites when they ask for a king. They had God as a king, you know, and they went to Samuel and said, no, we want an earthly king. You got God as a king, why do you want an earthly king? But they wanted a man to follow when they had God. And what a poor substitute is any man to follow uh, instead of God. It just, you don't understand it. And even, you know, Samuel talks to God about it because it upsets him. And he says, well, uh, don't get upset. It's not you they've rejected. They've rejected me as being king over them. And I want you to go warn them what's going to happen when the, I give them an earthly king. If they want it, that's what I'm going to give them, but this is what's going to happen. He's going to tax you. He's going to take your sons and your daughters to be a soldiers or work for him, and uh, he's going to make you work building his buildings and doing all these other things, and uh, eventually you'll be a slave, and in that day you will cry out to me for relief for the king that you chose for yourself, but I will not listen. In other words, this is what's going to happen if you choose this, and I'm going to give it to you, uh, if you choose it, understand that I've warned you, you didn't listen, you will experience the consequences of your actions. And a lot of people would say that was the beginning of the end for the, for the Israelites because it was, other than an occasional good king, most of them were humans with all their faults and frailties. Yes, sir, Ken. Verse 17, people that try to discount to baptism, they'll harp on this verse, but they're taking out of context. That's not at all what Paul's talking about. He's talking here about not letting people take his name in place of Christ. Right. And it doesn't mean that you're not, uh, your baptism is not necessary for salvation. Right, right. And I'm going to talk about that here in just a second. Yeah, he just didn't want anybody to say that he was following him or use him baptizing them as an excuse to say they were following him. So, God warned the Israelites, and even after warning them of everything that was going to happen with the king, they said, no, we still want an earthly king. Okay, give it to them. You know, why don't I just uh, give Samuel a baseball bat and let him hit you over the head with it repeatedly? It'll be about the same effect. But that's what they wanted. That's what they got. And uh, Paul, you know, it's interesting that even after all that, God lets them choose. He lets everybody choose all along the way. He sends prophets to... Uh, the Israelites over and over again, when he could have just destroyed them or made them bow down to him, but he let them choose. He sent a prophet to warn them over and over again. They either listened or they didn't. He gives us his word today to warn us. We have a choice. We can listen or not listen. 
It's always our choice. He gives us a choice, but with the choice comes the consequences. Go ahead. Um, who is Chloe's people? Who are they referring to? That's uh, um, some members of Chloe's household, I think. Yeah, it's just Chloe's a member of the church, and these are people of her household that have relayed this to Paul, that there's all this division. People are saying they follow different people instead of Christ. That, uh, um, and he's trying to point out to them that uh, uh, you don't follow men. You don't follow these other men. You follow Christ, yeah. Um, and in verse 16, um, he says, I did baptize also the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized anyone else. And then verse 17 that Ken mentioned, For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. So there are people who read this verse, and a substantial amount of them, that say, oh, well, that means you don't have to be baptized. Well, first of all, they're taken out of context, as Ken mentioned. But second of all, even if you just read the verse, it doesn't say that. Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. It doesn't say he didn't, baptism isn't necessary. He said, that's not what I was sent to do. He doesn't say that somebody else wasn't sent to do that besides me. It's just reading into it something that's just not there. It's not what the text says. And that's, if there's one thing to do when you, when you read the Bible, obviously there's stuff in Revelation that's, you know, uh, apocalyptic language and symbolic and whatever else. But generally, just read it for exactly what it says. And exactly what it says is, Christ didn't send me to baptize, but it doesn't say that he didn't send someone else to baptize or that you don't have to be baptized. That's reading something into it that it, it just doesn't say. So, but let's go look at another common misconception about baptism that ties in with this. If you turn to John chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. Gospel of John chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. And this, this is one that's misunderstood too. Any comments, any thoughts, any questions before I go on? Okay. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. And here's another case where people read something into it that's not there. There are people who will say that Nicodemus was a coward because he went to see him at night. That's possible. That is one possibility, but it doesn't say that. For all we know, with the crowds thronging around Christ during the day, he wanted to go to him privately and have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with him and understand where he was coming from. The fact that he went to him says he's interested in seeing him and learning from him, and he recognizes that he's a teacher from God. So. Again, reading into it that Nicodemus is a coward, maybe so. Um, I just don't see it. I see him as a man who's, for everything you see there, he's a man that's going to Christ, trying to understand where he's coming from and who he is, and uh, get to know him. And so Christ doesn't really respond to his statement there directly. He just says, Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And of course, Christ is talking in spiritual terms, but he doesn't quite understand that yet. And then in verse 5, it says, Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. So he's pointing out to him, I'm talking about spirit. Do not marvel that I say you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. So, um, and I, I ran into this one with my aunt, and I found out there are other people who believe this too. They believe, she believed that uh, uh, being born of water in the Spirit, the water part was your, when you're born. The amniotic fluid, you're, you're born there. And, and again, I, I, th that is reading something into it that just is not there. First of all, the conversation is predicated on, the, or what Jesus says is predicated on the statement, he says, unless one is born again. So he's not talking about your, your uh, natural birth when you're born out of your mother's womb. Uh, and again, being born of water in the spirit, everybody's experience is a natural birth that's alive. Uh, 
it just does, it doesn't follow logically from what Christ is saying. He's talking, the whole thing starts with being born again. So he's talking spiritual terms, and he's talking um, being born of water and the Spirit. Obviously, if it's in spiritual terms, he's talking about baptism. And uh, yeah. repent and be baptized, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So being born of water and the Spirit is uh, not your natural birth. Any rate. And uh, that's just, if you just read that for exactly what it says and don't read anything into it there, uh, I think it's pretty obvious, but, you know, some people don't see it that way, uh, and that's okay. Um, if you ever have somebody that sees it that way, you can give, use it as an opportunity to have a discussion with them about it. I tried discussing it with my aunt, but she's pretty hard-headed, and it runs in the family. Uh, and <laughs> she, she, was a, uh, she just couldn't accept uh, what I was trying to tell her. And again, she's entitled to her opinion. We can disagree and still be agreeable. So, and then again, as if to put emphasis on that again, Acts 2, 38, 39 is repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the gifts of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit as we read a minute ago. Promises for you and your children and all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. So again, all these things tie together, and if you read them, if you don't just take one verse out of context and not read it for what it actually says or consider other verses and how they tie in with it, that, that's the key to understanding it is um, you really got to read the Bible. You got to study it, think about these things, and again, just use a little common sense. Yes, sir, Ed. The, uh, the thing about the Bible, when we look at different accounts, you see a lot of people in the Bible, godly people, that have initial reluctance to do what they're told to do by God. Yeah. In Abraham's case, God had told Abraham to leave his father and his, his father's house and his family and go to the place where he would show him. Uh, God told Abraham to do that more than once. Uh, we have Moses who was reluctant to lead the children of Israel out of, out of Egypt. Uh, two weeks ago, Ken uh, used Naaman's story in, in Second Kings and his reluctance to go and dip in the Jordan River. And in the New Testament, Jesus says in Luke chapter 4, verse 27, that Naaman in the days of the prophet Elijah was the only one that was healed of leprosy. Uh, when you look at John chapter 11, verse 16, you have Thomas having a reluctance to go to where, uh, go back to Jerusalem after Lazarus has died. But Lord, we'll go with you. And then finally, Luke chapter 5, verse 5, we have uh, Peter's reluctance to let the nets down one more time, even though they've been fishing all night. And the reward was there. In all of those, there was a reward even though they had to get past that initial pushback. And I think we have to remember that when we're talking to somebody about salvation and baptism and forgiveness of sin, we have to realize that even Jesus had a, an initial pushback right. in, those, in those accounts. Yeah, and I agree. You know, all we can do is, is speak the truth to them as nicely as we can, you know, in, in love. And, you know, you never know. I'll give you an example. My own, my own case, um, I've told you guys before, I didn't become a Christian until I was almost 38 years old. But um, I remember when I was in college, I was struggling with the stress of college, and, um, and my mom had a lot of mental health issues, and uh, uh, probably my behavior didn't help that either. But I was just really struggling, and I, had, I was working for TBA in the summer of 78, and I had to go, I think, to Gallatin, I believe, for a physical. I don't know why I was way up there because the office was in Pulaski, but at any rate, that's where I went. And... Um, I talked to the doctor there, you know, he was giving me my physical, and um, I just told him how much I was struggling, the things I was doing that were, in, in hindsight, very counterproductive. And he said, uh, he just said one thing to me. He said, um, you know, it's been my observation that God is the answer to all our problems. Now, it didn't sink in then with me at all, right over my head. But I still remember that now, that that guy took the time to try to talk to me about it. So if we take the time to try to talk to people about it, even if they don't agree with us, uh, they may consider it, think about it, and, and uh, you know, hear what we have to say. Maybe not now, maybe 10 or 15 or 20 years from now. You don't know 
what seeds you can plant in somebody's mind just by going out of the way to be nice to them, and they remember that. This guy went out of his way to have a genuine, out of a genuine concern for me. And your point's great, yeah. There, there may be an initial pushback. There may be people who don't want to hear what we have to say. I've had guys curse me in jail up and down. <laughs> Seriously. And then start coming back to Bible class and start asking questions and start listening. Um, it's, uh, you just don't know. You don't know what God can do in somebody else's life. You, you stand, try to point him in the right direction and stand back and let him do his thing. Remember the Israelites when, uh, when they were scared and they were right at the Red Sea and, and uh, the Egyptians are coming. They're like, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Uh, and Moses said, I'm kind of paraphrasing here. I don't remember the exact verse, but um, stand back and watch uh, your God deliver you here. Uh, all you have to do is be silent. Stand back and watch. What, we'll let God do his thing. All you have to do is sit there and shut your mouth and quit, quit complaining and let him do his thing. And he did. So, and that's, <laughs> that's something I wish I had done more is realizing that God is who he is and, and instead of trying to fret and, and figure out all my problems myself and drive myself crazy, just sometimes you got to let it go and let him do his thing. Great point. Thank you for that. So, um, again, verse 17 uh, of 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Uh, d definitely does not say you don't have to be baptized, but people, again, it's the thing that's hard to understand is why, let me get back to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 here, is the, the to your point, Ed, the reluctance to be baptized. Um, if there's any doubt, why not just do it? Even if, even if you don't think it's necessary, why not just do it? If God says do it, just do it. It's not hard. You can change your clothes in there in five minutes, get baptized in less than five minutes, be back out here, change your clothes in five minutes, 15 minutes, just to do something simple that God asked you to do, to your point, with Naaman. Same thing. God told him to do something simple. He didn't tell him to do anything complicated, and yet he took offense at it, his pride. I think that's when we resist um, what God has asked us to do, I think it just comes down to our pride, right? We're hard-headed. Um, I am too sometimes. It's a very human thing. Yes, sir. I personally would would much rather teach someone that has a, a measure of skepticism about them yeah. than someone who just takes everything that you, that you feed to them. I think one of the frustrations I have with folks that were, have been raised in the church, that's, that, that's all they've ever heard, that's all they've ever known, they don't question anything. I want you to question everything. Right. I want you to, to go to the Bible and prove why you believe what you believe. Right. And don't believe it just because Greg said so or I said so or the elder said so. I want you to go to the Bible and prove it for yourself because ultimately you're the one that's going to have to take the knee before Christ. Right. It, you know, it, it's your life and it, it is a, a personal thing between you and God. Um, I, I wish more people did that. I wish, wish more people questioned it a little bit and then dove into the Bible to figure out why. You know, I, I think that's what, you know, going back to that story in John 3, Nicodemus, I, I would have had a really hard time at, at that time hearing a, my whole life that a Messiah is coming, and then this guy right here is supposed to be him, and Nicodemus was a religious elite of the chosen people, right? So this is one of God's people who was supposed to know what needed to be known, and this, this is the guy, this, this is who we've been hearing about. I would have had trouble accepting that. I would have been trying to figure out his angle or how does, how does he pull off all this stuff. And, and yet Nicodemus was hanging in there. He was trying to, to figure out what was going on. You know, Paul, Saul of Tarsus later on, he knew who he was, right? He was, he was a Pharisee. He, he, right. he was a religious elite. He had his life totally figured out. Hebrew of Hebrews, you know, he says right. in, in uh, Philippians 3, you know. He knew what tribe he was from. He, he knew the purpose of life, and then all of a sudden he gave all that up to, to be a follower of Christ. And I'm sure, you know, it, it took something pretty, pretty big, you know, losing his sight and being, you know, stricken on the road to Damascus to be able to do that. Um, as a convert to this church uh, in my 20s, 
I had to do that, right? I had to sit down and figure out why, you know, where's the piano at? Why? You know, why do we do this? Why, why are we taking the Lord's Supper? Why do we meet first day of the week? And I think that's healthy for a Christian or for a, someone who's who just starting to come to church. Ask those questions. Why do we call ourselves the Lord's Church? Why, you know, and if you're a visitor, if you're sitting in here in this room, raise your hand and ask those questions because those are the things that we want to hear. Yeah, absolutely. And I was the same way because I really wasn't taught the Bible. So I just thought it was all nonsense and fairy tales. It took me picking it up and reading it, and nobody told me to do that. It was just I was struggling so much in my life at the time that I was looking for answers, and I picked it up and started reading. And if you can ever get somebody to pick it up and start reading it, you, you can, they'll start reading and they'll start asking you questions because you can't put the book down. But I, the guys in jail, they ask some tough questions. And, uh, you know, again, they're a tough audience sometimes. You know, they're very skeptical. But I tell you, it, I know over at... Um, we did worship service at CCA. You go over there and you start talking to them and you see these men, they're, they're big and tattoos and they're, they're tough looking guys. And, and um, you know, you start reading the Bible, start talking about it and you see 75, 80% of them, the tears streaming down their face. Again, nothing about me, like you say. It's, it's God's word that does that. They want to hear it. And they, if you really listen, yes sir. I wasn't trying to uh, break you off or nothing, but um, and to to his point as well, you know, for people like me who have been raised in the church our entire lives, you know, it can be challenging in the sense that we get into the sense of traditionalism, essentially, yeah. is that I've been in the church, this is what we do, we go to church every Sunday, we pray, we sing, we have a lesson, we do all this stuff because we believe it, and we don't challenge our thoughts as much, and I, that's that's been a roadblock for me before is I need to figure out why I am doing this. You know, because sometimes it can be, you just feel like you're doing the same thing. Right. Um, so, and that's important for us who have been in the church, you know, to ask those questions so that we can answer them for other people who are looking to join uh, our brothers and sisters. So I, I think that's something that we need to take into account is that we can, you know, for those of us who have been in the church, we need to always be studying and be figuring out because it's, you know, it's, you learn something new every, every single time you read the Bible. I oh, yeah. do. <laughs> um, yeah. And I need to, I need to get better about that is asking those questions so I can answer those questions for other people. I agree. I, I think it's good to have all types of people in the church. People like me who weren't raised in the church. People like me who came to it later. Because, again, like Danny said, you know, we started reading it and had to challenge what we thought. But coming to a church with people like you who have been raised in the church and have studied the Bible up and down, left and right. You know, if I have a Bible question, I know I can go to Terry Rust and he's going to give me, may not be an answer that I understand or necessarily agree with, but he's going to give me an answer that comes from a guy that studied the Bible up and down and has, it's, it's wonderful for me to come into a church where, like the first time I went to Highland Heights Church of Christ and Wayne Cornwell started speaking, he opens up the Bible, okay, let's see what it says and what we can take from that. Really? Can we do that? Because that was just a foreign concept in the church I grew up in. Nothing against the people I grew up with, they were some of the finest people I've ever known. They just, um, so it's good to have people of all types, but to your point, I think it's also good if you've lived inside the box your whole life, like you're talking about, it is good. Sometimes it's hard to think outside the box. That's where people who didn't grow up in the church are an asset to you, just like you're an asset to me. Every, everybody has something to offer, regardless of what their background is. And I think, again, that's, I want everybody to feel included in my class. I don't want to feel, anybody to feel left out, left behind, like they can't speak up. Or, even if you have a question after class, stop me, ask me. Um, I'll keep talking to you until you probably say, Brother Mark, I'm tired. I want to go home and go to sleep. Would you just please shut up? Um, but we're all, we all should be here for each other like that. Like the Bereans in uh, Acts 17. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Studying the scriptures daily to figure out why, to figure out if those things that were taught to them were true. Everybody has something to offer. The, I have learned more since I started with the prison ministry about the Bible than I ever knew before that in the six or seven years since I've been doing that because of the questions they ask that make me think. And I have to, 
I say, well, that's a great question. Either I know the answer or let me think about it, go back. And I have to research, I have to study. Like I say, I'll go to Terry. Uh, but these men are, are looking to change their lives. So they, I owe them the best answer I can possibly give them. Yes, sir. I guess I'm going back and want some clarification on something you okay. said. All right. You said that if a person was talking about baptism and all like that, and they don't believe, well, what's wrong with just being baptized, just do that. I think you've decreased the importance of baptism. I think you've got to know what you're doing. Right. And that not just because, if you say, I don't believe, but you need to be baptized, and they're baptized just for that. Right. That's not baptism. Right. And I think you left that we should just, if they disagree, just go ahead and be baptized anyway. No, I don't think that's right. Because if they don't really believe in the baptism, then it's not going to do them no good until they are convinced right. or study and know that. And I don't think we should just say people should just be baptized. Right. Oh, I agree with you 100%. And I think what I was trying to say there is that, that my... Um, in this particular case, my, my aunt, we had a discussion about it, and she, we agreed to disagree about it. But I, I agree with you 100% that, uh, um, and I hope I didn't give that impression that you tell people to be baptized, they're supposed to be baptized. Yeah, if you don't believe and understand what you're doing, you're absolutely right, then it's meaningless, right? There's no point in it. Uh, you have to believe, you have to understand, it, you know, you have to hear and believe, first of all, otherwise you're just getting wet. So, thank you. Okay, so we have a few verses left here, in, um, and, and again, point of 1 Corinthians 10 through 17 is we don't follow men. Don't put any man on a pedestal, certainly not me. I don't belong there. Um, consider what I have to say. If it agrees with the Bible, then consider. If it doesn't, then Let's have a discussion about that, because uh, I have been known to be wrong occasionally. My wife will tell you that. Okay, so verses 18 through uh, oh, excuse me. Yeah, I got a wrong reference there. So. Verse 17, Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Okay, verse 18 says, For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For instance, since in the wisdom of God the world did not know through wisdom, the world did not know God through wisdom. It pleased God, pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom. Greeks seek wisdom. We preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. So in the end, the word of the cross, to someone who's new to it, it will seem like foolishness. Can you imagine Paul when he went to preach to the Gentiles who have no knowledge of Judaism or whatever else? It's just like when he went to Athens and spoke to the people there. They were willing to listen to him. You give them credit for that. But in the end, some of them said, this, this man's a babbler, but some people wanted to hear more about what he had to say. And you can imagine when you're telling that story to somebody who has no knowledge of Abraham or Isaac or Jacob or any of the stuff in the Old Testament, it, it seems like a crazy story. You mean there's this guy that came to earth and he died and he was the son of God for redemption of our sins and I need to believe in him and, and if I want to forgiveness of sins and, and be baptized into his name and all this stuff. It must have seemed like you had, had to believe that people were thinking, okay, what's this guy up to? What, what's he, <laughs> is he trying to get money out of me? Is he trying to just see if he can get me to believe some crazy story? Uh, what's the deal? Uh, so yeah, it, it's, it must have seemed like foolishness to them, but uh, he points out to them that's just the wisdom of God. What seems like foolishness to the world, the fact that this man who was born and grew up poor, who never had anything but the shirt on his back, 
This one man changed the world more than any man before or since him. Uh, you, you think of God, that that's God's plan, but that's God's plan. It, it seems, if you think about it in human terms, it may seem foolish, but again, that's Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God through, not through our wisdom, not through something that necessarily makes sense to us right off the bat. But, and he says in verse 25, for the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. What may seem foolish to us is uh, God is much wiser. He understands that whatever he does, even, and he's kind of, there, God is not foolish, but he's just saying if he were foolish, it's still way wiser than anything we could possibly think of. Yes, sir, Jason. It must have seemed incredibly foolish to the elites of the day that he called fishermen, right. you know, a tax collector, a zealot. Uh, it would be the equivalent today of, of him coming and it's not gonna be the politicians that he calls or, or those in the higher ups. It, it's gonna be the waitress down at Waffle House or you know, the construction worker or, or you know, people like that. And I, you know, that's part of the appeal of Christianity and, and what seems to make it so unique from even competing faiths where you did have this elite uh, you have the you know caste system in Hinduism, where you know there are those who are elevated above the others, and uh, so it, it is. It's fascinating to find uh, yeah. wisdom through foolishness. Well, I think um, precisely why he cho chose average, ordinary people is to demonstrate that it wasn't their wealth, their wisdom, you know, all their possessions or anything else that he accomplished. Thing he took average people to accomplish these things because. He wanted to show it's me, God, doing this. Through, and, and if you look at the people that throughout the Bible that he picked and called and chose to serve him, it's, it's kind of a motley crew, really. Uh, just all kinds of different people from everywhere. But God is wiser than any of us. He knows. We don't know why he picked Abraham, but you see from Abraham's faith and his life and everything else that God made the right choice. It doesn't say why he picked him, but we see his behavior showed that exactly why God picked him, why he chose Paul. Ananias was, must have been dumbfounded. His chin was on the floor. This guy is going to be the guy that takes the gospel of the Gentiles? Um, <laughs> it just, but again, he picked someone who was stubborn, hard-headed, determined, who was going in the wrong direction, but once he was shown there of his ways, was going to be a force to be reckoned with, and probably outside of Christ, the person single most respondedly for spreading the gospel around the world. One man. He picked him, and he knew who he was picking and why he picked him, and it shows. So, to finish the chapter, uh, God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of the Lord. Um, foolish things in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. And that, that's a very personal, makes me think of something very personal there because I told you my mom died of Alzheimer's. When she was dying, I'd go down and see her. And, you know, sometimes she didn't even know hardly anything. Um, you know, as far as, she had memories of a long time ago, but, you know, the short-term memory was gone. She'd lift up the sheet on her bed and ask me what it was. She didn't know what it was. But I went down there um, one Friday evening. I would go see her on Friday evenings after work. My kids were little. That was the time I had to go basically during the week. And um, so I went down there and it had been a bad day and I think it was a UT Alabama game that weekend and traffic was awful. And I was just in a, not in a good mood when I got there. And um, I walk in there and sit down and start talking to her. She starts singing a hymn of praise to God. And I thought, here she is in a nursing home, you know, in a situation most people would consider horrible, terrible, whatever. She's got the presence of mind to sing a hymn of praise to God, and here I am, I'm young and in the prime of life, able to do anything I want to do, and yet my mood has been negative all day long. Have I said any praise to God today? The foolish things of the world can shame the wise, and I, that was a very personal example of that to me. And he says in verse 30, and because of him you are in Christ Jesus, who has become to us wisdom from God, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. So that it is written, let one who boasts boast in the Lord. 
Christ is everything. Wisdom from God, righteousness, sanctification, redemption. He's everything we can't be. And in verse 31 there, he's, um, he's referring, he's quoting partially Jeremiah chapter 9, verses 23 and 24. Um, if you go there, Jeremiah 9, verses 23 and 24. While you're getting there, I'd like to make a quick comment. Yeah, go ahead. Um, you know, God, in, in the Old Testament, God used a harlot to help get the, um, to help get the Israelites to the promised land, or to help uh, get the chosen people to the promised land. I mean, God can use anybody in this world, and we will pick, pick and choose people sometimes because of what they do or something we've seen and we should still in a loving manner tell them that your actions may not be what God wants you to do but we can still talk to these people we can still encourage them that doesn't right. mean that we're just to push them away um, and also to your um, point of what you're saying on wisdom you know I've, I've worked with a lot of people um, <laughs> and I've, I've not been on this earth for near as long as they have, but with the time that I have been here, I have found wisdom does not always correlate with age. Um, my understanding of wisdom is people who have been through experiences, who have made mistakes, but learn from those mistakes. Just because you've been doing something forever and you're still making the same mistakes does not make you wise. <laughs> right. um, yeah. And I think that people will get caught up in that they'll say I've been doing this forever and ever and ever I'm wise I know what I'm doing and yet they're doing the wrong thing um, so and there's there's you know there's the exact opposite of that there's people who have been doing the right thing for a very long time and people my age simply won't listen to them because they think that they know better yeah. um, so we just need to be aware on both sides of that oh, yeah. I think I was that guy before when I was 18 you can't tell me nothing I'm an 18 year old grown-up man I know everything have to laugh at myself. Uh, but I think we do learn, if you're like me, I think most people, and I won't speak for everybody here, I just speak for myself, but I think a lot of people feel the same way. We learn more from our mistakes than our successes. Um, and sometimes we learn, <laughs> make some really bad mistakes and learn a really hard way. But the point is that we learn. And it, what is really sad, and I've, I've known people like this to see them making the same mistakes over and over again that are destroying their lives and destroying their relationships with other people and people try to talk to them about it, they refuse to listen, they keep going down that road. That's, that's sad is when somebody doesn't learn. God knows we're gonna make mistakes, but he, he wants us to learn and not repeat them. Uh, again, it's sad when someone just for whatever reason just cannot seem to do that despite the best efforts of everyone who knows them. That's, that's a soul that God is deeply concerned about and uh, he doesn't wanna see that happen to them, but um, that's their choice. He lets people choose even, like the Israelites, when they ask for a king, choose something that he knows is going to be bad for them, but yet, this is what you want, I'll let you choose it, but you will experience the consequences and uh, um, hopefully learn from them, or maybe not. Um, but Jeremiah chapter 9, verses 23 and 24. This says the Lord, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom, let not the mighty man boast in his might, let not the rich man boast in his riches, but let him who boasts, boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For these things I delight, in these things I delight, declares the Lord. Um, nothing, when I look at myself, I see that I am nothing in this world other than what God has allowed me to be. He's put me in a situation where I can succeed. Now, did I have to go to work every day? Did I have to go to school? Yeah but I could have been born in a situation where I had no opportunity or nothing. So can I boast in any wisdom I have? Well, whatever earthly wisdom I have, I got because my parents sent me to kindergarten, which was not a thing. They didn't have public kindergartens. My parents sent, paid to send me to a private kindergarten, which gave me an advantage when I went into first grade because I could already read and knew my alphabet. And I had good teachers in school. and I had good teachers in college. And I worked with people who were very knowledgeable in what they do. So I've acquired all this wisdom along the way 
yeah, by somewhat by my own work, but just by being associated with people, being in an opportunity. So my wisdom, did it come from me? It came from God, really, in, in the situations he's allowed me to be in. Uh, uh, the mighty man boasts in his might. Who, who's mighty compared to God? And uh, not the rich man, rich man boasts in his riches. Whatever I have, again, is what is God has put me in the situation to have. Uh, didn't come from me. Yes, sir. Tools in the arsenal in the Bible. You know, you're talking about um, people like in the in the Old Testament, the Jews sought to you know seek a sign. Well, when we look at just the composition of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the the three Gospels uh, that are written to specific people, we can see where. The book of Matthew, what has to be started with? That, that book was written to the Jews 30 right. years after Jesus' right. uh, ascension back to heaven. And what does it start with? It starts with the genealogy all the way back to Abraham. Uh, Luke is written to a judge, a pagan judge, Theophilus, and acts as a continuation of that letter to the same recipient telling the story. Mark is only 16 chapters where Ma uh, Matthew is 28. Why? Because the Jews had to had to be shown. You had to. There were so many places where it had to be referenced back into the Old Testament. It was almost like the Jews came from the Show Me State. What's the Show Me State? Whichever one it is, you've got to show me. You've got to prove right. it to me. And so when we look at it today in in this world, it's a lot easier, perhaps. In, in certain circumstances to take someone that has never darkened the door of a church building than it is to convince somebody that the denomination that they are going to is in error for whatever reason right. because you have to use more. Mark is a very simple uh, book and what does it start with? It starts with John the Baptist preaching right. Jesus, you know, the one that, that carves the way for Jesus. And so uh, a lot of times the confusion and, and the extra uh, lessons and teaching and reinforcement has to come from false doctrine that has, that has gotten in there and done the right. confusing. But the one thing that all four Gospels, counting John, all point to in the first part of the book is Jesus is baptized before right. he begins his ministry. Right. And so there's, there's your... your you know, a, a good solid foundation if you're trying to explain the necessity of baptism, the, that that is the marriage, so to speak, of the bride of Christ, the church, to, right. to him. And it, they right. all, all four of those books have a reference to him being baptized in the Jordan. Yeah. And, it, you know, at the end of Matthew, he says, baptizing every, all men in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, whatever. But the interesting thing is that you know, when he went to be baptized by John, John says, I need to be baptized by you and you come to me. And Christ said, let it be so to fulfill all righteousness. Christ had no need of it, but he was setting an example. If, and if, again, that's just another point when you're talking about baptism to somebody. If Christ submitted to it, even though he had no real need for it, as an example, then, um, you know, and that's, again, that's something you talk about to people, try to explain it to them. Um, but I think the, the Bible is the wisdom that God has given us. That, that's where the real wisdom is, you, you, but you have to pick it up and read it. Yes, sir. I think sometimes we are in too big a hurry for results. Right. We never know what we do, and we may, never, we may never see it, but it may do something if we plant the seed. Yeah. And I think we're wanting results right away, and it may not happen. It may be years. I agree, yeah. It was years with me. I had some people plant a few seeds. I, it started with the good people I grew up with because they were fine examples of how to treat your fellow man. So it started with knowing them, and it started with uh, a lot of things, but some people trying to point me in the right direction along the way. And you know what? Uh, I know my mama prayed for me. I know she did because I know her. And uh, God answers prayers. Um, I don't think I'd be up here doing this today if she had. I really don't. Uh, there's a lot of factors that go into taking somebody 
And again, to your point, preconceived notions are harder to overcome than no preconceived notions. Uh, but that, that's, anytime somebody asks a question, I look at it, you know, whoever it may be ask, ask a Bible question or whatever else it may be, it may be a question about work. I see that as a, even if they're not so nice about it, I see that as somebody, try to see it, I don't always do it successfully, try to see it as somebody asking me for their help and understanding that even if they give, even if it comes with an attitude, whatever else, they're asking my, for my help, they're just not doing a very good job of it. So it's, every, everybody is, has worth and merit in God's sight and even the people in this world that are, that are terrible, terribly difficult to deal with and, and most of the time the people that are like that are isolated, lonely, miserable, they're unhappy because they just can't seem to get along with anybody and they don't, some of them don't understand why and that's what's really sad, it should be obvious, but, but everyone has worth in God's sight, you know. When, God, when Christ said, uh, when Peter said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, that means every one of you. He wants everyone. God wants everyone. And everyone has worth. Okay, I've run over here. Um, any more comments, whatever, before we stop? Like I said, I'll stay here and talk all night till y'all are telling me to shut up. I want to go home and go to sleep. Do we have a closing prayer? Who can, who's doing that tonight? We bow. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity we have to come together in the middle of the week to, to learn about your word, Father, and to dig deeper into it. And we thank you for Mark and the lessons that he has prepared and pulling from your scriptures, Father, and help us to, to study it now and study it when we get home and to study it every chance we get, Father, so that we can be what you would have us to be and to know what that would be and to, to be the Christians, the examples, the leaders, whatever the case may be, Father. We ask as we go our separate ways. You grant us safety and bring us all back together to the next appointed time. It's your son's name we pray.